The question is, why is it when you make a resolution to do something good, why is it that we can't end up doing it sometimes? The reason, my brothers and sisters, is very simple. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala man bu'itha rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Glasgow arises. The month of Ramadan is approaching us very quickly. In just a few days, the month of Ramadan will begin. Now, before we talk about Ramadan being the ultimate boot camp, let me ask you a question. How many of you wish that you could be sinless, that your sins could be forgiven? Put your hands up. MashaAllah. Some of you don't need to, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> of course, all of us, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Kul ibn Adam khatta. That every son of Adam is a sinner. And the word used is not khati', someone who just makes a mistake. The word used that the Prophet ﷺ used is khatta'. It's like the one who really sins. He sins and he sins and he sins and he's a professional sinner. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Listen carefully to this amazing hadith. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan out of iman, out of faith, wahtisaban, and seeking the reward and hoping reward from Allah, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbih. His sins that he has done in the past have been forgiven. Allahu Akbar. Isn't that amazing? Yes or no? This comes to us every single year. But what do we worry about in Ramadan? The samosas, the pokore, the chaat, right? But really the ulama of the past, the early Muslim scholars, what would they worry about? For six months, before Ramadan comes, they would pray to Allah, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to reach Ramadan. Because they understood, those early Muslim scholars understood the powerful nature of this amazing month. A month full of blessings and reward. A month in which the paradise, the gates of paradise are wide open. A month in which the gates of hellfire are closed shut. A month in which the devils are locked up. A month of mercy, a month of forgiveness. Man sama Ramadana iman and wahtisaba. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan out of iman, out of faith, not just to be hungry, not just because other people are doing it, not just because people are looking, no, out of iman for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hoping for reward, realizing that his reward is in the hereafter. The one who does this, that his sins that he has done in the past have been forgiven. My brothers and sisters, this shows us how important this month is. This month, how many people do we know that were around in our lives and maybe they have passed away and they have never they will never ever see another Ramadan again. We all know somebody who's passed away and they will never see Ramadan again. As long as we are here today, 
As long as we are here and we reach Ramadan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reach Ramadan. There is our opportunity to make that change, to take this blessings and use this month, a month which is the ultimate boot camp. What does that mean? Ramadan is a machine, brothers and sisters, that you come in as one person and you leave as a completely different person. That is when you know that you have truly benefited from Ramadan. Ramadan is not just a month which is meant for food, you know, for hunger and thirst. No. Ramadan is a month of change. The Prophet ﷺ talked about the one, you know, that Allah has no need for the fast of the one who is just, you know, he's just starving himself. He's just starving himself. But he's not controlling his tongue. He's not controlling his other limbs. He's not avoiding sin. So Ramadan is this machine. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum usayyam, kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah gives the wisdom. Why do we fast? What, why has Allah obligated upon us the fasting? Of course, there are many wisdoms. Among them is that we look towards the poor people. We feel empathy for what they feel. We are able to give more charity in this month. or We, we feel more compassionate, so we give more charity in this month. But that's not the only reason. There are, of course, many health benefits. That's also not the only reason. The ultimate reason that Allah tells us in the Quran, the Lord of the heavens and the world, the one who obligated Ramadan, what does he say about why he obligated Ramadan? Kutiba alaykum al-siyam. O you who believe, siyam, fasting has been prescribed for you, has been made obligatory upon you. As it was prescribed for those before you. Why? So that you may be of those who attain piety, taqwa, God consciousness, fear of Allah. That is the ultimate reason. So you could go without food, without you know, water, without your marital relations for an entire month of in the daytime. But if you do not get this objective of Ramadan, then you've lost out of this in this blessed month. My brothers and sisters, Allah says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. Those among you who are the most noblest people in the sight of Allah, who are they? The ones who have taqwa. The ones who have this God consciousness. And that is the point of Ramadan. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may be of those with taqwa. But how do we achieve this, my brothers and sisters? How do we make Ramadan this boot camp? How do we get the best out of Ramadan? Perhaps we have sins, or not even perhaps, we do have sins that we do day and night, and we want to get rid of those sins. Yes or no? Who wants to get rid of their sins? Who wants to stop doing those sins? Everybody. Every Muslim, he doesn't want to continue doing his sins. But many of us, we are trapped. We don't know how to get out of this sinful life. Maybe the sins are great, major sins. Maybe there are small sins. But we should not look towards how great or how small a sin is. We should look towards how great the one we are disobeying is. There's no such thing as a small sin in reality when you look at the greatness of the one whom we are disobeying. So how do we stop this, these sins that we do? How do we become people who do our obligations, that we pray five times a day, that we hold our tongues on things which are haram, like backbiting and slander and you know, talk, lying and things like this? How do we do these things? How do we avoid sins? Have you ever felt that you wanted to give up a sin? 
and you had the resolve to do so, and then when the moment came, you fell into that sin again and again and again. Who's felt like this? Have you ever wanted to do a good deed? You set your alarm for Fajr, or you set your alarm for Tahajjud, and you wanted to do it, you had the intention to do it, but as soon as that alarm went off, you pressed snooze. And in the end, you lost out on that good deed. Who's done this before? All of us. But the reality is, why is this? The question is, why is it when you make a resolution to do something good, why is it that we can't end up doing it sometimes? The reason, my brothers and sisters, is very simple. Our souls are not trained. They're not trained. Insan, the human being, is composed of three components. The aql, the mind, the intelligence, the intellect, the body, the badan, the body, and the soul, the ruh, or the nafs, the soul inside of us. These three components come together to, be, to create something called man, human beings. If one of these three components is deficient, then the entire component or the entire human being is deficient. And the same goes with our religion. If our souls are deficient, or our minds, our belief system is deficient, or our worship that we do with our bodies is deficient, then our deen, our religion is deficient. What does this mean? When you command your soul to do something good or to avoid something bad, the soul is like a wild horse. It's like a wild horse. Now imagine you're on a wild horse and you're trying to tame this wild horse. How do you tame this wild horse? You've got your rider and you're trying to tame a wild horse. How do you do that? You jump on the horse and you take the pain. And you grab hold of the horse's neck and you just simply take the pain. The horse will go left and right and fast and slow and it will try its utmost to get you off its back. And you have a choice. Either when you feel the pain, you fall off or you jump off. You can't take the pain anymore. In which case, the horse remains the master. Why? Because when you jump on the horse and you try and get it to go left or right, you're not going to be able to. The horse remains the master. And he will take you wherever, the horse will take you wherever it wishes. But if you, if this rider stays on the horse, takes the pain, refuses to fall off, and even if he falls off, he jumps back onto the horse and he keeps on trying, eventually that horse will realize that I have no choice, I have to obey. Now, the master is who? Who's the master? The rider. The rider becomes the master. And if the master says, go right, the horse must go right. If it says, go left, it will go left. If it says to speed up, it will speed up. But if you do not tame that wild horse, then you will never become the master of that wild horse. You'll never tame that horse. You'll never, it will never obey you. In the same way, our souls are like these wild horses. When you want to tame, if you want to do a good deed or avoid doing a bad deed, how do you do this? You don't just wake up one day and suddenly become pious. It doesn't work like that. We all know somebody that we look at and we think, ah, mashallah, if only I could be like him or her, right? But the reality is these people, they don't suddenly become pious. They don't just wake up one morning and, you know, wow, they're, they're all pious, okay? Hashtag bear pious. <laughs> they, they don't just wake up like that. 
How do they do this? They tame their souls. And how do you tame your soul to obey you? Because your soul is like that wild beast, that wild horse, that you want it to get up for fajr, it refuses. You want it to stop doing this sin, it refuses. It continues to do that sin. Any good deed that you want to do, it refuses. Why? Because we have not tamed our souls, the beasts inside of us. But how do we tame these, these souls? How do we tame our souls? It's almost exactly the same way as you tame a wild horse. You have to force yourself. How many words is that? Force yourself. How many words? Two? No. Three. Force your self. What's your self? Your soul. Force yourself. How do you force yourself? When that alarm goes up, goes off for fajr, or for tahajjud, or whatever good deed that you want to do, when the time comes, you have to take the pain. You have to take the pain. And the first time when you take that pain, it's going to be difficult. But over time, your soul will begin to realize that, you know what? This guy is not giving up. I've got to obey. And it becomes easier and easier for you. Yes or no? And that is how we stop doing bad deeds. And that is how we increase in our good deeds. Those deeds that are difficult to do. Maybe you find it difficult to pray five times a day. But how do you get yourself to do that? You force yourself. And over time you will tame that wild beast inside of yourself. Or inside of you. And the same thing when you want to stop doing a sin. You force yourself. You take the pain. And this, my brothers and sisters, is like a bitter pill. When you take a medicine that, it, that tastes disgusting, you take this medicine and you have a choice. That the very first time you take this medicine, it's disgusting and it feels horrible and you want to spit it out. But if you spit it out... Will you see the benefits of that medicine? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. So what do you do? You block your nose and you force yourself to take that medicine. Yes or no? Because you realize that this medicine has certain benefits. It's going to cure a certain illness that I have. And if I don't take it, maybe I won't be cured. So you force yourself to take that bitter pill. And the first time it's disgusting, it's horrible. You don't want to do it. But then as you continue, every day you're taking this bitter pill. What happens after a few days? You begin to tolerate it. Yes or no? Then what happens after a few days? Say, hey, this isn't that bad. I like this stuff. And then what happens after a few days? Or a few weeks? Or maybe a few months? Hey, I like this stuff. This stuff is good. It's not bad. And then eventually, because you see the benefits of this, you begin to like these good, these pills. And then finally, you can't do without it. You're addicted to this bitter pill. Yes or no? Because you see the benefits of this. In the same way, when we tame our souls, it is like this bitter pill. We have to take that pill. You, you force yourself to get up for fajr. You force yourself to wear a hijab. Right? Not the brothers. <laughs> you force yourself. Ask any sister who didn't used to wear hijab and then began to wear hijab. The first day she wears hijab, how difficult it was. Yes or no, sisters? Yes or no? It's difficult the first day, I've been told. <laughs> it's difficult the first day. But over time, it slowly becomes easier. Then you begin to like it. And then you begin to love it. 
And then finally you can't do without it. Yes or no, sisters? Yes. And the same thing with your prayers. When you didn't wake up for Fajr, it's the norm. That's the norm. It's difficult. It's like something strange if I get up for Fajr. But then when you force yourself and you take that bitter pill, it's tough. It's difficult. You're yawning all day because you're not used to it. And then after a day or two days or a week or two weeks, you begin to like this. You tolerate it first, then you begin to like it. Hey, I like getting up for Fajr. I like getting up for Tahajjud. I like doing this deed or that deed. And then what happens? You see the benefits of this. You begin to love it. And then as time progresses, my brothers and sisters, you cannot do without it. You can't do without it. If you miss Fajr, you feel like your world has fallen apart. If you miss Tahajjud, you feel your world has fallen apart. And this is a practical and real method of doing any good deed that you want to do and leaving any bad deed that you want to leave. You simply force your self, your wild self. You tame that self and you go through the pain. You eat that bitter pill. You tolerate it for a while. You eventually begin to like it. Then you love it and then you can't do without it. My brothers and sisters, this is what Ramadan is all about. Because for 11 months of the year, we have shaitan whispering to us. But in this month, the month of Ramadan, the shayateen, the devils are locked up. Now the question comes every year. People ask, okay, if the devils are locked up, how comes there's so much evil in the world? Yes or no? Yes or no? People always ask this. And that's because they think that all evil comes from the devils. Listen, if shaitan's been training you for 11 months, <laughs> you're on autopilot. <laughs> hey? You're on cruise control. You don't need the whispering. That's why there is more, there is still evil in Ramadan. And some scholars say that, you know, they gave th this explanation, not the autopilot bit, but the, the, some scholars, they give the explanation that for 11 months of the year, shaitan is training you. And then this 12th month, or the, it's actually the 9th month, which is the month of Ramadan, you're, you, you are on autopilot. Any evil that you do in Ramadan, they say it's from you only. You can't blame shaitan. That's you. And then other scholars, they say the great devils are locked up. The big shayateen are locked up and the smaller ones are still around. But it seems to be the stronger opinion seems to be the first one which I mentioned. Now, Ramadan is the time when the shayateen are locked up. Isn't it going to be easier, therefore, to train your souls? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes, of course. So that is the time that we need to make sure that we're up for Fajr, not just for Suhoor, right? You make sure that you're up for Fajr. You're praying your five times daily prayers. The first night of Taraweeh, the masjid is ram-packed. Then the second night, the third night, by the fifth night, uh-uh. Right? By the fifth night, it's empty. Well, not empty, but it's a lot less. And then the last 10, it comes back up again. Right? Yes? We need to make a resolution that we're going to be consistent throughout Ramadan. Of course, there are certain days, like the last 10, which are more important, more rewarding. But, let us try and build towards Ramadan. Now, what I say, my brothers and sisters, Ramadan's coming. Now, it's like a marathon, okay? Now, can you just run a marathon... Can you run a marathon without any preparation, yes or no? Of course not, you can't. So if you go, if you wait for Ramadan to start doing good deeds and stop doing bad deeds, then what's going to happen? The first five to ten days, you're, you're just, you know, trying to get into the swing of things. I'll give you an example, right? I drink a lot of tea, okay? I drink tea. Now, you know, those of you who are tea or coffee drinkers, 
What do you normally get the first day of Ramadan? Headache, caffeine withdrawal symptoms. So I realized, you know what, you can, because, I mean, alhamdulillah, I live in Mecca, we have a really hectic schedule in Ramadan in the sense that we live a little bit further away from the haram, so it takes a while to get to the haram, and then you're literally on the go. So there's no time to drink tea, right? And it's a diuretic as well, which is another problem. But, so what happens is I get a lot of headaches in Ramadan. So I thought, okay, a few years back, I said, listen, I need to prepare beforehand. So let me just give up tea a few days before Ramadan, like a week before Ramadan. I'll cut down to like two teas and then one tea and then, you know, eventually half a cup of tea. <laughs> and then eventually it's like no tea. But if I wait till Ramadan comes, the first few days are going to be headaches. Yes or no? So it's the same way with good deeds. Don't wait till Ramadan comes. Start practicing from now. Start giving up the sins that you want to give up. And then what you can do is not just go from minus to zero on the first day of Ramadan. Build yourself up to one, two, three, plus one, two, three, five, whatever. And then from the first of Ramadan, what you're doing is you're going from plus five to plus, you know, hundred. Rather than starting from minus to upwards. Is that clear? Yes or no? Yes or no? Remember, we put up our hands at the beginning of this speech saying that we want our sins to be forgiven. I have given a practical way. It's not just some mushy dovey talk without anything practical. Yes or no? We've given a practical method to use this Ramadan wisely. Let us make this Ramadan the best Ramadan. Remember, my brothers and sisters, من سام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. Whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith, iman, and hoping for reward from Allah, then his previous sins are forgiven. That is something that we all aspire to. We don't know on a serious note. We don't know how long we've got in this world. We don't know if we will ever see another Ramadan. We know that we sin day and night. This is our opportunity. Allah has sent this gift out of His infinite mercy. He sent this gift for us. Let us make this Ramadan different. Who of us is going to try and make this Ramadan different? Let's make a resolution from now. Put your hands up, guys. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this month of fasting and standing, this beautiful month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. Allow us to change our lives in this blessed month. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.